My name is John Kennedy and I came to your way back in 1957. And in 1957, there were radio cabinets being made in Yall. And I wondered how it all came about. So I wonder I was talking to Davy Hayes, a great friend of ours, very involved in motorcycles, things like that. But Davy worked below in Store Street, what they called the mill, which was owned by John Murray. And apparently they made toilet seats, kitchen tables, uh, chairs, bedroom furniture, bedheads, bed ins, that kind of stuff for many, many years. And John Murray, unbeknownst to anybody, headed for Dublin one day and came back and told the gang below in the mill, lads, he said, you'll be making radio cabinets soon. And of course they had a great scoff at the whole thing, the idea of them fellas making radio cabinets. I suppose they were running themselves down that they wouldn't be able to make radio cabinets. But that's how it all started. And Davy Hayes made uh, the first prototype of the clipper. The clipper is, uh, or the Blue Peter, sorry, sorry. The Blue Peter, come down here now, that's... Oh. That is the first pilot radio made in Yard, and it's known as the Blue Peter. And uh, you can see there now, that, that's your design, and uh, that's a, a plywood cabinet, basically, but it has uh, veneers on it, and the veneers are beautifully done uh, to give the impression that it's solid wood, solid walnut look, and cut in, but it's only a plywood, but it's done like that. And Billy Lafford is still with us, please God, he'll be with us for a long time, but Billy had two very strong thumbs, and Billy's job was to do those corners, to get that veneer on there and get those corners. And those cabinets were made down below in Yall, and that was the first cabinet they made. They sent that off to Brownlee in Dublin, uh, Brownlee brothers were uh, long into the thing and uh, they got the idea of making radios here and uh, they had a whole load of uh, girls and fellas above in uh, Molesworth Street in Dublin and they built the chassis for the radios because there was a new law had come in that you couldn't bring in radios into the country without paying an enormous duty on them. So the only way to avoid it was to make the radios here. But of course you could, they could make the radios above there but they couldn't make the cabinets. So that's how this cabinet started being made in Yard. That was the first cabinet. Davy made it, as I said, the prototype, Davy Hayes and a few of the lads with him and they sent it up to Dublin for the approval of Mr Brownlee. Mr Brownlee approved it and he sent down an order for 20 cabinets or something like that. And that 20 became a thousand and two thousand maybe eventually. And there was radio cabinets made there for the following 10 years. And uh, there's some more of them here. Now that was, as I say, the Blue Peter, that was the first one. You will find, by the way, they all have maritime names, which is very interesting. This was the Mariner. This was known as the Pilot Mariner. That, that's about 54, that one, I think. You'll see the design is basically the same, but you'll note now here, look, the veneers that are on that one out there and all the extra work on that one and the two lines across are not on this one. So they got a bit more, I suppose, easier ways out of making them, not putting the detail into them as the years went on. But that is now the, the Pilot Mariner. It would have been about 54, 55. It lasted for a while. Now, uh, we had, there was a, a clipper then uh, another another seagoing name, a clipper. Is that one? Now that's the same chassis as you can see. Look, the same design with the knobs, but it has a cheaper cabinet. It hasn't the the the, 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 the depth like the other one has. So that would have been cheaper. Now uh, prices. I would have. I would imagine. Oh, it's hard to remember what they were. But I'd say that was eighteen guineas. That's it. And I'd say that one was. 22 guineas and maybe this one went up to 24 guineas now you wonder what guineas are now michael but guineas were a pound and a shilling in other words it sounded cheaper than it was because 22 guineas was 23 pounds two shillings and that was where that was where the guineas come in now that went on as i say until the advent of television and when television came along another big industry and Pilot went into the television business. Now, 1960, we're gone up now to 1962 or 63, and uh, we have this wraparound Pilot, we call it the wraparound. It was a 23-inch television set. A 23-inch television set was enormous, of course, and, uh, and uh, you had this wraparound, and you had the controls at the side. Now, that was made completely from veneers, all bent around 
There's no corners in it, you can see that the whole thing is a beautiful design. And they had a new finish was invented at this stage. It was called polyester resin. I remember Davy telling me about this. You see, you had before that, you had the ordinary uh, uh, lacquer sprayed onto those radio cabinets, and you could actually clean it down and redo it yourself with, with, with varnish if you wanted. But with this, you didn't. You spray this with uh, polyurethane, I think some type of polyurethane or something like that, and then it had to be rubbed down and buffed to get a shine, and it was like glass. You can see the shine still, look at that. I mean, that's lying above in the shop for 40 years, that's it. And look how good it's still. Look how good it's still. That was, that was the wraparound. It's a mighty set, actually, that one. And that was the first one. As far as I remember, that was out before the 19-inch. Now, here's the 19-inch, and this was made uh, sometime after. That's the 19-inch pilot. That was the first one that came out. He sent down a sample to me to the shop from Dublin. And I thought this was a bad idea, this white grill here. Because I said, that'll get filthy in houses in a short time. Because you know the way things get dirty. I said, why didn't they put it into a different color? So I, I was talking to Mr. Brown. And he was down with John Murray one day. And he called into the shop. And I was talking to him. And he said to me, uh, what do you think of our new 19-inch? Oh, I said, it's a lovely little set. I said, but... Why did you put a white grill in it? Oh, he said, that was approved in England. He said, it won the Duke of Edinburgh's first prize for television design, he said to me. So I said, they wouldn't change it. Although two years later, that same set came out and they had a wooden grill in it and they got rid of the white grill. Now, whether I was right or wrong, I don't know, but that's what happened. Now, there's another little radio there, Tommy and, and uh, Tom and Michael. Uh, this one. Now, you'll be wondering about this set. I have no, I've taken the back off it deliberately. Now, have a look in there with your camera. I know you Do you see what's missing in that? Or would you be technically minded enough, Michael? There's no speaker in it. There's no speaker in the radio. So that's no use as, uh, like that. So what did you do with that? You connected an external loudspeaker to it. Because this was VHF. Now, we had no VHF in Ireland at the time. VHF is what we are using today for good sound and high fidelity. But in, uh, when this was made here, there was no transmission in Ireland. You had it in England on the BBC, but not in Ireland. So it wasn't of much use, but anyway, that was, what that, that was why that set came out. And it was a hi-fi set. You got a corner cabinet, a big cabinet with a bass reflex unit in it and a big speaker, and it gave tremendous sound. And that was the chassis was used for it. That was the one of their last sets. I have more of their last sets above in the shop uh, as well as that one. But I just bought down this sample of sets here just to show you some of the beautiful work that was done in y'all. You see another totally different design now. You see the way the other old ones had the knobs at different levels, that design. This one now had them in a straight line, a linear design. Things were changing. The dials were getting longer. The magic eye. That's the magic eye there, in there. Now, most people don't even know what a magic eye was. But a magic eye was the top of a valve inside, which had a green light in it. Uh, a part of it was dark, and part of it was light. And when you tuned the station at its best, the light part became very narrow, and the dark part was wide. And that was called the magic eye. It showed you when you were on the station correctly. That, they were all made, is it hard to imagine that they were all made below in Store Street? They were going out in their thousands up to Dublin in boxes by the railway, out to the railway and up to Dublin in cardboard boxes, all made up ready. Then above in Dublin they'd be opened again and the works would be put into them in Dublin and they'd be sent around to all the different radio shops around the country. Some of them were exported, I believe, to England at one stage when they were short of radios over there, we exported radios to England. And incidentally, the Bush sets, the Bush televisions were made in Castle Martyr, where sportscraft or where kitchens are now. Now, they exported, uh, Kilroy Brothers were the agent for Bush in Whitehall in Dublin, and they exported televisions in 1962 to Hong Kong. We were exporting televisions from Ireland to Hong Kong in 62. Big change from everything today coming from China, isn't it? Yeah, you said about um, uh, the VHF. I know there are yeah. these medium wave. Isn't it? You, you have long, long wave, short wave. Me, yeah. yeah. It was medium wave and long wave. You have short long wave, wave short wave, and medium wave, uh, as far as I know. I know in America you don't have any long wave. You have what they call the, the medium wave, but it's, they have a different name for it. So if you get the modern transistors coming in, they're basically VHF and medium wave because they're made for the American market. But we had long wave here for long distance transmissions. and. Uh, it's still, it's the only 
way of now, apart from VHF, that you can get anything on. You can still get Radio 4, and you can get Radio Paris, and you can get Radio Erin on the long wave. Now, why can you get Radio Erin on the long wave? I'll tell you, because there was Atlantic Radio, oh, and RTE bought it out. And a few years ago then, they got rid of all their medium wave transmissions, BBC did the same thing. BBC medium wave transmissions are all handed over to uh, local radio in England and uh, you can't get the home service or anything anymore. But you can still get Radio 4, the light program as we used to call it, on the long wave in 1500 metres. And you can get uh, Radio Air and where Atlantic Radio was. But it costs a lot to transmit on long wave, but it covers great distances. You can get Paris, you can get, and very good in, in England and everything here, whereas the medium wave didn't travel so far. When your radio started out, Michael, we started out, my Noel built his own transmitter. It was 202 metres medium wave, just below Luxembourg. Luxembourg, of course, was the radio station when I was a young fellow. Everybody listened to Luxembourg every night, 208 metres for the, all the pop shows, the uh, Irish Hour and the Scottish Hour and all those things that people loved. They were all on Luxembourg. And uh, there was great programmes on the long wave from the BBC, Friday night is music night and all the comedy programmes and uh, living with, with, with uh, Lynch, who came on Radio Air and you had Tony Hancock and you had Liv the Lions family and you had uh, much something in the marsh and all these great, great, great comic programmes all on, on the radio and people listen to radio every evening and they and they wouldn't miss it at all. And all the sponsored programmes, Beecham's Pills, etc., on Luxembourg, everybody listened to them. And uh, the soap powders, of course. In fact, that's why, of course, that uh, we call a thing today a soap opera, because all those programmes started out being sponsored by Surf or Daz or Rinso or some kind of soap powder. So they're called soaps. And, uh, of course, a lot of those uh, early comedy shows on the radio, they transferred over then onto TV. Then they the all went onto like TV. I know they're, and, they're, yeah. they're kind of fizzling out. It's very hard to keep up comedy. You're left to know about Mrs. Brown, and that's about a lot. Of, I see them advertising Mrs. Brown on BBC very much these nights, so it's amazing how that took over, you know. <laughs> uh, John, was, it just, uh, was that just uh, the medium wave at the time? I mean, there was no VHF. No, VH, uh, no. VHF came out in England in the 50s. This was a new system of transmission which gave a much broader bandwidth and gave great bass and treble to the music and it was wonderful for listening to classical music especially, or for any kind of music for that matter, but classical music, you got the whole spectrum of sound which you didn't get on medium wave because medium wave was only given out about 400 kc k kilocycles or something like that, the, the band, it had to be kept down. But when VHF came out first, we hadn't it. I don't know exactly what year we got it, but I remember above long ago when I was working in Cullum Shop above, uh, in the very fine summer weather, we had a, a, a pie set that came in at a special price that they were flogging off in England, and we had it above in the shop for sale. It was an, a Finn man. And uh, I sold two of them, as a matter of fact. One to Jim Coleman's father, and one to Ian Whitmarsh of the Royal Bar. Now, I had them in the shop, and I was messing around, and there was an old disused telephone line out the back. And uh, I took a lead in from it and put it onto the VHF section. And I picked up the BBC one day, which was absolutely amazing, because it was only just because it was fr under freak weather conditions. I picked up the BBC, and the sound was just glorious compared to what we were getting, you know. But we didn't get that until the 70s. We hadn't VHF here until the late 70s or 80s. I can't remember the years, but it didn't come. We, they had it in England after 10 years before we had it. I'm, I'm just going to pick you up there, John. Can you explain where, uh, where the viewers were? The Whitmarsh Bar was again, the Royal Bar. Oh, the Royal Bear, Ian Whitmarsh, yeah, was a great was man that, of music. Where was that again? What part of town was that? The, that was across, uh, what's there now? What do we think? You had the um, Munster and Leinster Bank. You had um, Johnny Ryan's pub. You had Mad, Madge Harney's grocer. And Ian Whitmarsh, the Royal Bear. And he was something else. He was Actually, he was about the only cafe, apart, apart from Long's up further. He was about the only cafe in Yall. And... Uh, he was an extraordinary man, and uh, that's where I used to go for something to eat in those uh, days. John, just to get back to medium wave again, when CRY were we broadcasting first in 1979, uh, it was on medium wave. Was there any time where they were on medium wave and the VHF or the FM at the no, same time? No, 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 no. The, they were a medium wave. Noel, Noel built the stage. Actually, the transmitter there is there, Michael, if you want to turn your camera around there. That's the transmitter, the top of the, the green thing on top of the... Uh, the, the filing cabinet there, that's the original part of the, 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 the little part of the transmitters we call it. It was 202 metres and invented by 
the bold Noel himself. He made that himself. And uh, uh, John, can you tell me uh, again, please, uh, please, the difference uh, between the wet and the dry batteries? Oh, what, you're what, going what, back. What, you're going back now to the battery set. Yeah, what, oh, yeah. they were not battery sets. They oh no, main they're all main sets. Right. But okay. when I was at home in Ballyquin, long, long ago, we had no radio. <laughs> And the first radio I ever heard was up at Jimmy Murphy's. He had a Sierra radio. And of course, they wouldn't have it on very much because you had to buy a dry battery and a wet battery. The dry battery was the high tension current from the, that you put to the anodes of the valves. And the wet battery was the uh, battery that you bought in and got charged. It was a two volt output and that lit the filament of the valves. And that was how you worked. Now, as sure as God, if you were watching a match or something that you wanted to watch, one of the batteries would go in the middle of it. And that's why people were very sparing. And they didn't put it on only for just to listen to a program in case the batteries would go in the middle of it. And that went on, of course, until the ESB came along. The rural electrification came to our more in 1954. And then everybody traded in their battery sets and bought electric sets. And then the battery sets were done up and fixed up and sold to people who still didn't get electricity, maybe till 1963. And that's how it went on, you know. Big change, no. So did wet, wet and dry batteries work in conjunction with each other? For the, oh, yeah, you had to have the two of them. Right. Because if the wet one went uh, uh, in the middle of a match, which it could just go like that, and uh, you had no sound. Now, the, the, dry, the dry battery was the one that gave the high tension. And that started getting weaker and weaker. And you would know it was going to go because the sound, but it might stay weak for a week. But the other one would go within five minutes. It suddenly just would go. And of course, there was a great trick. A bicycle lamp battery. The smart Alex put the bicycle lamp battery on instead of the wet battery. And that was three volts instead of two. And it damaged the valves in some cases, but if it was a bit worn, it wouldn't. And it could be the, the, the cause of you being able to listen to a match. But then if the, you damaged the valves and you bought it into Bobby Chapel, you'd get the head eaten off yourself from Bobby. For, Why did you put that to that? You know, it's a, it was war over. And finally, John, most of these radios didn't work unless they had an aerial, so you must have had some fun times oh, putting up aerials. Oh, yeah. When I started house. working for Colin Maloney in Dungarvan, uh, Michael, I used to, uh, averaging about, I'd say he used to sell three or four radios every day. And I'd be sent off out in the van with them. And you'd drill the hole in the window and you put out the lead and you tie it to a neg thing outside for insulated, another piece of lead. Bring that then across to a tree and another rig insulator, another piece of lead. And then you came in and you connected up the batteries and the thing. And they were all listening, just like television, to see what kind of reception you were getting. Oh, it, was, it, was, it was extraordinary. I mean, people really appreciated radio and television in those times. Not like, no, you know, it's just thrown around the place. Now. It's, it's, people have ten televisions and so on. I mean, it was such a thing. And I remember putting up the televisions when they came out again, the same thing, you know. They'd be all in, all the neighbours would be in, to see what kind of reception Mikey Hussey was going to get. And you'd have the tea and you'd sit down, and if you got good reception, they were delighted. Of course, if you got bad reception, might be too good, you know? But that's how it was. It's so different from what we have today. It's just unbelievable the way things have changed. What that have you there? That's a, a cassette player. That's a, a Zenit. That's an American portable. That's a Philips 19 guineas. That's an Avometer. That's a signal generator. And that's Bobby Chappell's valve tester. Oh, clever. Yeah. You plug the valves into that and switch it on into a set it it open because there's no woodworm, it was a bakelite cabinet. Never give Oh no, right. they were made in England, I'd say. Uh, Grundig, made in Germany. Uh, that was a Poi uh, walkie a transmitter for the cars, the vans used probably by the ESB, the, you know, communications. This is a Bush record player, 22 guineas it used to be. I remember selling a few of those. They were a very good quality record player, the Bush one. Made, a, I don't know, if they, bought, they were probably imported because there was no duty on, on, on record players where there was on radios. There was something terribly wrong about anything to do with radio. The ordinary person in Ireland was supposed to know nothing about radios. It was all hush hush. I remember sending one time five shilling post order for a crystal set. A crystal set was a a very simple radio. If you were living near a station, you could pick it up. I sent off my five shillings. I saw it in the Wizard comic, which we used to get for Tuppence. And they said, you can get this crystal set kit to make up your own crystal set, which was guaranteed to work for five shillings. I gathered up five shillings. It took me maybe a few months to get it up, because I was going to school at the time. And I sent it off to England. And the next thing, I had a big letter down from the customs. 
saying, under what license uh, did you import this crystal set? So I never got my crystal set. My five bob went down the drain, and that was the end of it. And why was that? They didn't want anybody to know anything, to my mind, anyway, about radio here in this country. It was kind of like something wrong with radio. You shouldn't know anything about it. It's nothing to do with you. You know, it's just one of the, those anomalies about Ireland. You know what I mean? Official Ireland. Oh, official thing, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Say, I mean, that's why we were, we were all so stupid. Because we weren't allowed. I mean, you had to go up to a college of technology probably to, to learn something about radio, or you had to be going to be a radio officer, or you had to go working for someone like I did and go out and fixing radios and try and use your brains yourself and find out what's on. But you were never, get, you couldn't get things or you couldn't get parts. It was always trouble about getting anything connected with radio. It wasn't a censorship. It's just type, that type of thing, that type of thing. An insular government we have to over through the years, and they've ruined anything Devil like that. Era? I, this is what I mean, and you, you got no chance for ordinary fellows to get on, to my mind, you know, unless you had somebody who knew something or somebody that was in the trade who could help you out. But the ordinary Joe soap didn't get very far. And that was a, a pie, you know. That was a pie. 18 guineas, I remember that was, that's it. It was made in, in Dundrum in Dublin, where the shopping centre is now. Now, Pye made their own cabinets and their own radios. A fellow called Dr. Dylan Digby was the boss man in Pye. Very advanced company. Pye were, Pye were so good that if you could get the Pye agency in a town to sell Pye radios, you were made. Because they were the best, ra best selling radio in Ireland, Pye. Way ahead of Philips or any of them. Uh, and uh, that, 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 that's another pie. That was the last pie that came out, re one of the last. You see the change there now comes, um, Michael, is uh, very important. You have, the, you have the wave change in, the, in, the, in that set. Look, you have a, a, a turnable knob for which This was the first change. Yeah, this was to put it off. And then you press whichever wave you want, and it put on the radio. Uh, the long wave, medium, short wave, and then you put it off by pressing that one. That was the uh, uh, piano tuning. That came out in about 58, I think. You see, as the years went on, it's just like motor cars. If you know about them now, you can tell by looking at it, say, the age of it. You know straight away. You see this one here, a little dial in it. That's an echo. You see that particular set now? There was a set like that, uh, made by, that was made by E.K. Cole in England, uh, Echo. That was where the name Echo comes from, E. K. Cole, South Indian Sea, England. They were never made here, but uh, they, they made uh, four, mar four of that ones. Once upon a time, they made four of them, Michael, in green instead of in brown, which was unusual to have green bakelite. I'm, I'm not cutting you when I tell you that Sony, for their museum in Japan, came over to London some years ago, and they bought one of those green, round Echoes and paid... £20,000 sterling for it, just to have it in their thing. So if you have a green echo lying around somewhere, it's worth £20,000. Now, there's another one which uh, they used to call that airplane dial tuning again. That, uh, looking at that now, I don't know what age it is, a Philips set, but I would, if you wanted me to, I'd ha a guess of that now is a 1935, about that. Now, there's, that's, I don't know what that is, that's a a power pack of some kind. But here you have the PJ500. That was 27 guineas, Michael, that's it. That was the top of the pie range in 1955. It was the PJ500. It had an extra uh, gang in the tuning condenser, an extra stage of tuning. Very good quality, beautiful sound. Uh, it has the trawler band, the short wave band, the medium wave band, and the long wave band. And it had what they called dual concentric controls. Uh, the two knobs are in, uh, incorporated into one another design. That was 54. Beautiful set, PJ500. Here we have the Pi Jewel case. That was made in England, actually. They were, I don't know what they made here as well under license or what happened, but that was worked on, on, on battery or it worked on mains. Uh, I'll just show you now if I can open it. Uh, now, you see, there's the works there, Mike. Right? Now you put a, height, a little, uh, a dry, what you had there was instead of the dry battery, a small 90 volt battery. And on this connection you had uh, uh, the low tension battery. And that lit the four valves. You had four valves, look, one, two, three, four valves, your loudspeaker thing. And that worked on battery or mains. So it's to save the battery, if you had electricity, you could plug it in. And that was known as the jewel case. Uh, they were very popular. I think they were 18, 18 guineas. I, I think they were 18 guineas when, 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 when they were on the market. This is, uh, of course, a VHS uh, system, which you know all about the cassettes, all gone now. 
digital now everything has changed this is a reel to reel recorder and there was somebody here the other day Noel tells me at the exhibition and they never saw a reel to reel recorder that was before the cassette and very good sound very good they have a stereophonic yeah, that's a stereo you had two speakers and it's very good quality excellent quality and you had two, probably three speeds one and seven eight three and three quarters and seven and a half inches per second the higher the speed the better the quality they had very high fi sound from very good uh, reel to reel but uh, they went and the cassette came out instead now the cassette is gone and the, you have the the disc instead you know so things are changing all the time this bush here michael is the very, very iconic set that's used if you want to do a play now and you want a, a transistor of the 50s, that's the set. Now, you'll see copies of that made today from China, uh, out today, and uh, then I did name bushes and on them because, of course, they can't probably put it on, but it's very like that because the inside was totally different. That was a very popular set. That was about 22 guineas, that set, as far as I remember. This was the, Poi, uh, the Phillips of the time. Uh, the same as that. This took a PP9 battery, whereas this took four U2 batteries. And a uh, very good set too, but you, with this you had to be very careful that you didn't leave the batteries in when they ran out because the batteries would leak and ruin the set. Whereas with the PP9, you hadn't leakage. This is uh, some type of uh, meter again that no one has a signal generator or something like that. And this is a, a communications receiver used by the uh, official. You can see the quality now in that, Michael, in the works of it. It's different altogether from domestic quality. It's much heavier and everything. That was what was made for the army and the navy and all that everything. Much more uh, dependable quality, if you know what I mean. It had to stand up to things. Uh, what have we here? A Sony uh, player or something? Yeah. Uh, I suppose a mini display and uh, a signal generator, signal generator and there you have a very very old radio that's at the beginning of radio Michael that one that's the very beginning of radio you had a couple of knobs at the side you had a, a, a speaker standing up on top of it with a horn and look at your tuning and uh, that's the original tuning look, look how small that is just a few figures in a little window and you turned it around till you got the station you wanted that were the days now of when you could buy it in kit form or buy it built, uh, you could buy the mains, the makings of a radio. I don't know if you could in here or not, but you could in England. You could buy that and you put it together yourself. But of course, most people wouldn't have known. And then when 1930 came, you could buy it either in kit form or made up. And then the kit form gradually vanished and everything was made up. You buy the radio made up, but that was how it started. And that is the famous trans uh, first transmitter. Output power 25 watts, frequency 202 meters, and uh, went into operation on the 4th of July, 1979, from Paddy and Eileen Connolly's attic above a knock of very far yard. And thanks very much indeed to Paddy and Eileen, and God bless them, because without them we mightn't have had community radio yard at all. There we have here now we have amplifiers, Michael. That was the only amplifier available on the market when I came to town first. That was a uh, 10 watt, I think, Vertexian. And this was a uh, 25 watt, I think, Vertexian that came out after. They were, and uh, this was uh, the first transistor amplifier that came out. I installed a couple of those in the churches for the first sound systems. That was one of them, actually. That was used in the parish church in York. Uh, they were quite good. That was, that was always available. Uh, that's a turntable there. We have a, an old uh, battery radio, I think that one again, Michael, yeah. What uh, make is it? Uh, Phil, Phil, Philco? I'm not sure. It's an old. Another one. And that's, that's definitely Philips, that one. That's a definitely Philips. You can see the dial is on it there. That was their design for a few years. Uh, they were very early with their long dials, actually. Most of the, most of the radios at the time had the uh, this is this has their aeroplane dial they call that. Look, it swings around, look, and you see they turn it around from station to station. And it was very clever because you could bring it around quick, but then there was a slow section where you could find the station exactly. Look, if you want to pan that, then run quick again. We have a little mini here, a little TRF radio here. There was a lot of those came out, very popular in England, a very cheap set. 
or three valves, so to speak. They were what they called tune radio frequencies. They weren't a super heterogeneous receiver. They were inclined to whistle a bit. And there you have the first car radio that I remember that was made by Poi. It took an enormous amount of current. If it was a six volt car, you had it It took about 14 amps. It was extraordinary and uh, had a vibrator in it. And uh, you had all that inside in the car. Then the next one was this one. You would put this part in the car and this part under the bonnet. And uh, they were connected with a heavy cable. I remember installing that into Keneally's bus in Dungarvan for Colin Maloney long ago, and of course the same to, to, to suppress the noise and the clicking was just impossible. But uh, there wasn't a bad radio, and uh, that's a, a signal, um, uh, an oscilloscope made in um, Russia, as far as I know that one. And uh, of course, we, we, with that now, if you were very serious about finding a fault in the radio, you had to know what you were doing, and you could get the uh, the graph of what was happening and the different stages on that, provided you knew how to do it. You wanted pretty good to work that in a oscilloscope.